Good morning. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Moid Youssef. I direct the South Asia program here at USIP. Um, and I'm in a slightly different role today than I usually play here. Uh, because much of what we do as um, a Washington institution is security. So we talk a lot about security, US-Pakistan relations, where things are, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but USIP as an institute does a lot of programmatic work in countries around the world. And one of our strategic priorities is arts and culture for peace building. Um, the problem, as I was telling my guest today, is that this town still remains security centric. So this is a fairly bold and brave move on my part to say we are now going to start talking about things that actually have a very different kind of impact, different kind of audience, but are as important. And when skeptics, and I myself uh, have to put my hand up and say I am one when it comes to art, uh, arts and culture, but when skeptics talk about this and say, well, how do you know it works uh, in terms of peace building? Uh, my answer is the only thing I know so far is that security doesn't work. So let's try and figure out whether this works. But, but what we've been putting so much money behind and effort behind has not worked, demonstratively. Um, so it's in that vein that I uh, have the honor of introducing uh, our panel today, who'd essentially be talking about uh, three things, and then or at least taking off, um, using three questions as their anchors. One, uh, what is the intersection between arts and culture and peace building? Uh, so there's a lot of talk about it, but what really uh, uh, works when the rubber meets the road. Second, do artists themselves look at their role as peace builders? Because if there is uh, effort going into this and artists themselves don't actually think of themselves as peace builders, then they're not leveraging their potential uh, in this area. And third, if they're not doing as much as they should, what are ways to get artists themselves uh, to look at themselves as peace builders and, and move this space forward. So that's essentially where we're going to start off. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to also say that we have uh, people on the panel, uh, at least one of them who's worked um, very actively on a USIP project. And you've seen some uh, murals outside that are productions of that project in Pakistan. And I'll let uh, Shiloh talk about that. But let me introduce our panel. They'll speak for about 12 to 14 minutes each. Um, we'll then open it up for a Q&A, and then don't leave when we end, because I have uh, arm-twisted Salman into agreeing to play a little bit for us uh, after we are done. Um, so let me just introduce them uh, in the order that they'll speak, and, and then we'll begin. Uh, Noshin Elahi uh, serves as founder and director of Muse District, a nonprofit organization that creates space for creative expression and intellectual collaboration across the South Asian diaspora in the United States. I got that right. Um, but essentially, uh, she is using the language of arts uh, and culture as an integral tool of communication uh, with the global community. Um, she's also actively been involved in promoting and showcasing South Asian arts, literature, and music, um, and originally comes from Pakistan. Um, Shiloh Shiv Suleiman, who is engaged in the USIP project in Pakistan, is the founder and director of the Fearless Collective, an awardee of USIP's Peace Innovation Fund, through which we, we uh, support uh, endogenous innovative ideas uh, for uh, promoting um, the, the cause of peace in South Asia. Uh, she's also worked uh, or works on gender issues and then uses art for social change. Uh, she is from India and um, happened to be in, in the US, and so we, we managed, to ma managed to get her down here. Uh, Salman's. Um, First introduction, and the most important one, is that I spent my teens trying to gate crash his concerts and failed miserably. So he owes me one. I've already told him that. Um, but he's a Pakistani musician, uh, rock guitarist, uh, physician by training, um, but now also an activist and professor at Queens College um, in New York. Uh, and he was one of the leads of the Junoon Band. If you know anything about Pakistani music and don't know Junoon, you've been somewhere else. Um, <laughs> He also serves as the UN Goodwill Ambassador for the United Nations HIV AIDS program, also the ambassador for the polio campaign in Pakistan, um, and has been doing documentaries and solo guitar albums. And I believe there is also a made in Bollywood film. There is, and uh, actually there's a HBO <coughs> movie coming out, open your eyes. Here we go. So, so, so a lot, lot, lot there, and I, I won't sort of belabor this one. So let me let me uh, begin this with Noshin, and then we'll move to um, Shiloh and Salma. Thanks. 
So I'll just start off by saying I just started this Muse District just as a fun thing to bring Pakistani arts and culture to the US just to engage the community here. And I thought perhaps we needed a competing narrative to what goes on in the media and how we're portrayed and what the stereotypes are just to um, counter that. But um, quickly move to uh, Moid's uh, question on how arts and culture is an intersection for peace building. I wanted to say arts and culture is in itself intrinsically a peace builder because in essence it's a medium that's used as a non-violent form of expression. So to ask how we can use art and culture for peace building, I think that in itself is an answer and a solution uh, for peace building. Um, like Moit said, the art-based initiatives are usually not tangible. There's, um, there's no way of um, seeing the effects of it um, in conflict resolution. So there's no way of putting a number on it and seeing how effective they are. But there are lots of um, examples um, in conflict resolution uh, in the past where arts has been used as a tool um, to build peace. There's a case of Bosnia where art-based projects were used um, to um, counter the narrative of pain and uh, resolution. Then um, you have hip hop activism in music industry, which usually counters political um, resistance um, um, through uh, hip hop activism. In <coughs> Pakistan, you have Shahzad Roy, who usually uses music as a good tool uh, to resist. Uh, politically, you have a Joka theater that over the years um, has used its platform to uh, provide political resistance uh, through General Zia's period and even now. Um, you have a lot of visual based art projects that provide an alternative space um, and a medium to um, counter, um, you know, just to f sort of provide a non violent form of expression. Um, art can be used in various ways to express that. Um, I, I will just focus on how arts can be used and how it has, it can be uh, extended even more in Pakistan um, to infuse um, peace building in the community. Um, you have I, IRS, IRC, a Lahore based theater that's using its platform to um, create more theaters to engage with the community, to bring um, more political debate to the people. Um, it's, um, you have Coke Studio that's brought in um, Sufi music to the mainstream. Um, you have independent cinema that's recently taken off um, really well. You have these young directors who've, um, who are indulging and in bringing their vision um, and and being agents of social change by bringing that uh, into the arena. Um, here in the US, we try, we've try we tried to bring in a lot of the independent cinema from Pakistan um, to effectively transform and communicate the way people think and act. Um, it's a good me medium. It's easily disseminated. Um, there's some great Pakistani films that have come out um, that counter the present narrative. Um, there's this great movie that came out that addressed the issues of girls and birth of girls and attitudes of society towards girls. There was one movie that came out that explored the motivations behind militancy and terrorism. Um, there's a recent one that we played here, Shah, which was just not a biopic of a boxer, but interestingly, um, was an expose on corruption, poverty, and resilience. But it's interesting how these artists and directors are using their medium to spread their message. So this particular film has not only delivered an expose of corruption in Pakistan, but he's actually taken the um, um, all the earnings from it to help build a boxing institute in, in a shanty town um, outside of Karachi. Um, and he's supporting 16 PhD students to um, promote um, um, arts and culture. So, and then we have documentaries that have come out of Pakistan. Uh, Sharmin Obeid Chunoiz, which cannot be overlooked. Uh, she addresses gender-based violence. It's a great way 
to um, document issues at hand in Pakistan. Um, it's, it's great um, to bring these issues to light. A lot of people have objected to the fact that such um, documentaries do negate our, um, um, which, uh, how should I put it, um, sort of our image. But I think it's, it's great to bring them, especially to the US, because it not only provides um, a great platform to spread the word, but also bring the issues at hand to light and help collaborate with people like um, the World Bank or um, other uh, think tanks to work on le legislation, to find um, support for legislation in Pakistan. Um, what else? Um, So then I want to move to um, how the Pakistani community here needs to engage in arts and culture. We strongly, the reason we set up Muse District was partly because we felt there was a need for space um, to talk more in terms of culture. Um, you have this huge immigrant um, community here, and you said, see them all congregating in community centers, which are headed by mosques. Um, Charity-based uh, programs like that are great. They're inspirational, they're very warm and welcoming, especially for people who have just been dislodged, dislocated, and are finally settling in America. But it also strips away all your other identities. And I feel strongly if we don't infuse these communities with um, different arts and culture-based programs, you're stripping them away of every other identity but that of religion. Um, that in itself is... Um, um, I feel it needs to be countered by providing a cultural narrative. Um, we don't have other community centers that can identify these communities. Um, and it does disturb me sometimes where all of us, regardless of where we come, come from, whether we are from Pakistan, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Bosnia, or anywhere else, or anywhere else in Africa, and we're all known as just Muslims. Um, there's nothing wrong in that, but you do take away every other ideology but that of religion. Um, and that dogma is hard to um, compete with then eventually. Um, so I think there is, a need, there is a need in Pakistan for arts and culture, but there's also a need for it here for these communities who are, are just settling down and are recent immigrants or just making a, you know, a home for themselves here. Um, I'll stop here and then we'll take the first. Sure. Thank you. Right. Um, so you're going to have to excuse me. I have a bit of a scratchy throat today. So, um, and also a lot of visuals to show you guys. So I'm the founder and director of the Fearless Collective. Um, Shut up. Oh, my camera. And just to give you a sense. There we go. All right. Um, just to give you a sense of what we do, we're essentially a global movement of public art that's inclusive, collaborative, and tries to replace fear with empathy. Um, the way that we do that is by using art and storytelling in public space as a medium to shift social attitudes towards fear. Um, in my own life, just stepping back even a little bit, art has definitely been an incredibly transformative tool. Um, through my own conflict growing up, I started, both me and my mother started to paint. Um, and uh, by the time I was 16, I was publishing children's books, got really interested in storytelling, um, started to look at the intersection of technology and storytelling as well, so launched a series of books on the iPad, gave a TED Talk at 21, um, started working with neuroscientists and making these large-scale installations, basically, that uh, would react to your brain waves and hearts and breath and all kinds of things. Um, but at some point, uh, I happened to be in Delhi for a friend's wedding uh, in December in 2012, uh, when the protests following the gang rape of Nirbhaya broke out. And um, I was there, and suddenly, like, there was this amazing wave of energy that was uh, kind of erupted outside India Gate, and I couldn't ignore what was happening. So all of us went out in our wedding garb and everything and kind of stood out onto the streets and stayed there for two or three days. And it was incredible, because for the first time, we had this, you know, incredible movement of people finally coming out and talking about um, how gender violence had affected their own lives. But after a while, the fear-mongering in the media started to get really counterproductive to the change that we needed to see, because women were more afraid of stepping out um, in public space. Women were being told that if they take a bus or um, 
you know, walk alone at night, then something could happen to them. And this fear was completely counterproductive to actually the peace that we needed to be building. So I put out one poster onto the internet that said, I never ask for it. And it said, fearless underneath. And um, before I knew it, it grew into this viral online campaign of hundreds and thousands of women across um, the world essentially sending in these beautiful affirmations of fearlessness. Now, the reason why this is important is while you have the you know, dominant narrative of fear that uh, the media is constantly spreading. This was a movement of people actually sharing their own stories uh, of survival and reclaiming their right to their own narrative. Um, it first grew, like I said, into this big online campaign of posters, but since then also we took it out onto the streets, and it was really on the streets that we felt like the campaign flowered. Um, the reason for that was because we were suddenly engaging in dialogue um, that was beyond language, right? Everybody understands a visual, and so, Slowly, it became into this guerrilla movement of people putting up posters all across India. Um, beyond the poster campaign, uh, we realized, like I said, that it was really in public space that um, the power of these images uh, existed. So um, we realized that there was this kind of common link between the street art movement and the feminist movement, which is the re need to reclaim one's right to public space. So of course, feminists are saying that I need to be in that bus, on that um, you know, platform, um, and, and feel, not feel fear. And street artists are saying that my art has a right to be here with all of the political propaganda, all of the ads, and all of the Bollywood posters, invariably, that we see um, all over the streets. So, in a nutshell, what we do now, many years later, is we're a global mo movement of women and girls reclaiming public spaces through art and storytelling. Um, we make films, educational resources about art and activism. Uh, we engage with marginalized communities in very immersive workshops that draw from art therapy, from gestalt therapy. Um, and finally, our methodology that we're creating is completely open source, so anybody can set up their own fearless collective and do work in uh, this, their own context. Um, and also, of course, going back to the roots, we create, um, you know, do crowdsource digital campaigning. Now, the reason why this is important is we've seen the power of, that the Obama poster had, for example. We've seen the power of uh, that one image of Che Guevara. You go to any village in, like, Rajasthan and you'll, you'll find <laughs> people wearing Che Guevara t-shirts, which is the most random thing ever. But if we can actually start to replace all of those images with uh, things that, that are actually relevant, that are contextual, um, and also thinking about how much of our brains are visually driven, um, I feel like there's definitely a potential for, for change. Um, in terms of our process, it's very, very inclusive. We do these workshops with communities, um, understand what the issues are within the community. Um, and these are really, really kind of safe spaces that we create. Um, the emphasis here is on two things. One is storytelling as a medium of building empathy between communities. So if I tell you my story of what happened to me as a child, uh, perhaps you'd care a little bit more. And so that's the first foundation of the work that we do. The second is also um, personal and positive affirmation is a medium of social change. Part of the rhetoric uh, around a lot of, I think, um, kind of activist campaigns are is 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 sometimes counterproductive, like this, you know, stop violence against women or hang the rapists. Like, who are we speaking to? Um, I really believe that that these the quieter conversations, the conversations between mother and daughter or husband and wife, those are the things that also um, sometimes spark or place little seeds. So, the workshops allow for those kind of quieter whispers, those conversations to to happen. Um, the second is the process itself. So now none of the girls in this picture or none of the communities that we engage with have ever picked up a paintbrush in their lives. But uh, through the process of working with us over three or four days, um, that itself becomes an act of reclaiming or fearlessness because you're doing something you've never done before in this kind of scary, <laughs> um, permanent way. Another thing about our process that's quite important is also that we're actually projecting images of ourselves. So uh, we do photo sessions at the end of each of our workshops where we take photographs of ourselves and then we actually project it and paint that in public space. Now, the reason why that's important is, again, um, you know, politicians, film stars, and in India, gods and goddesses uh, completely dominate um, every, every wall. And there's no representation of actually like real people, real stories. So this becomes also into a really important part of the process. And then there's a the finished mural itself, um, which, you know, is very often created within the community itself um, has had everybody be a part of it. It's not, us is not the kind of project where we come in, in the middle of night, you know, and like spray paint something and leave. Everybody knows we're there <laughs> um, and everybody participates. All the chaiwalas, all of the people on the street, everybody is very much a part of um, our process. And also the dialogue that occurs while we're actually painting then and for uh, in over those days is equally important. Um, we see that 
Fearless is part visual art, but also part performing arts, because we're here and we're actually speaking to, to each of the people that come to us, but also putting ourselves in vulnerable positions. Um, the wall that we just painted in Delhi, we did you know, a group of girls painting through the night, and we create those safe and sacred spaces that we wish to see. Um, so that's the, the kind of finished mural that comes out. Now, the Fearless Collective in Pakistan was particularly exciting for me, um, being you know, the only Indian person on this panel. Um, and Nida Mushtaq, who's my collaborator on this project, basically wrote to me saying that she wanted to bring the project to Pakistan, and, and USIP uh, gave us this incredible grant that made it possible. Um, and of course, the theme that we wanted to explore was this idea of inherited fears, right? And especially as an Indian person, there's a lot of inherited fears that come through. Um, I had my grandparents who were affected by partition warning me that, like, you know, you shouldn't go because it's not going to be safe. And as I entered, there was this beautiful saying that said, Kasbe Kamal Kun ki Azize Jaha, which uh, means, and we shall make such beauty with our hands that we will be loved by all or understood by all, which really actually kind of became into the fearless narrative in Pakistan. Um, in Lahore, we were working with a group of young artists. Um, and already, this was a, a big deal also, because so in Pakistan, there are two groups that do street art. Um, but primarily, they focus on doing either very graffiti-style writing or portraits of Jinnah and Pakistani flags. And so being an Indian woman uh, in Pakistan, working with other Pakistani women, and basically painting, you know, pictures of ourselves <laughs> on the streets um, was definitely a security threat uh, and an independently kind of organized project as well. So uh, the first community that we worked with in Lahore, uh, we were working with this group of girls and um, talking about inherited fears and what stops us from actually looking at ourselves as peace builders, you know, taking on um, art as a, as a tool. And one of the things that came up was uh, fear of judgment. Now, every Pakistani or Indian household has heard this log kya kahenge uh, rhetoric being told to us, right? Like, log kya kahenge if you become into an activist. It's like activists and hippies almost in the same, um, uh, you know, sentence. Uh, but so in, in Lahore, we were essentially exploring this idea of inherited fears and this idea of uh, inherited judgment, like what, why we stop ourselves from doing the things that we want to see in the world. Um, we did a really immersive workshop, um, and then over two or three days, actually over two or three hours, uh, one day in Lahore, we painted um, this really beautiful mural that says, Log kya kahenge, hum to log hai, hum kya kahenge, which means, um, you know, what are people going to say? We are the people, what are we going to say? It was a, it was a smaller project compared to the, the larger scope of work that we, were, we had in Pakistan, but it became into a really important first reclamation. Um, it also happened to be actually on the the wall of the National Bank of Pakistan, completely by accident, <laughs> um, and the mosque of the National Bank of Pakistan, and without permission. And the director came out at some point, and he's like, "What are you guys doing?" Took us into his office. Um, you know, I was expecting to essentially be thrown out when he looked at the work that we were doing, and he was like, "All right, keep going." <laughs> so. Um, that was, that was Lahore. In Pindi, we were working with this incredible NGO called Vajud that uh, does work with transgender communities, uh, the Khwaja Sara community, um, and normalizing transgender employment, and basically looking at all of the security threats that the transgender people themselves feel in their lives. Again, ended up in this beautiful moonlit courtyard in a Khwaja Sara, uh, Babli's house um, in Rawal Pindi one night, uh, talking about love and you know lost loves and and um, you know how belonging and acceptance. Um, and from the workshop um, emerged this huge mural, 40 foot mural of a transgender person riding a motorcycle in Rawal Pindi. Now this is the only representation of a transgender per person created by transgender people in uh, all of Asia. Uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, you know, again, when we look think, think about representations of people in public space, we are looking at ads and, and Bollywood posters. But um, for the community to actually come out and create this large mural was huge. And um, very often, the act of doing it, um, like I said, kind of becomes as much an act of reclamation. The the image itself is is Bubbly riding her motorcycle, and she says, "Hame takli ke khuda," um, which means um, "I am divine" or "I am a creation of Allah," which is actually a really powerful um, reclamation as well. In Liari, we were working essentially with um, this this group that's the offspring of humans of Liari, 
And now Liari is known to be the most unsafe part of Karachi. But when I was going to uh, Pakistan, everyone's like, don't go to Pakistan, Pakistan's unsafe. Then when I was going in Pakistan, everyone's like, don't go to Karachi, because Karachi's unsafe. And then when I was in Karachi, everyone's like, definitely don't go to Liari, because Liari is super unsafe. Um, Liari has been ridden with lots and lots of gang, like a very intense gang violence uh, in the last couple of years. It used to be the jewel on Karachi's um, uh, port. Um, and as you walk around, you can see the tags of the different gangs kind of graffitied onto the walls. Um, but simultaneously, also, play becomes a way of reclaiming those, those spaces for a lot of children in Liari. So it's this weird kind of dual existence of, on one hand, <coughs> this uh, history and reality of violence, but on the other hand, also, people playing out, out on the street, like Tash Ke Patte and, you know, merry-go-rounds. And so we really started to explore this duality of being both simultaneously safe and uh, kind of creating safe spaces, but also uh, feeling like you were incredibly unsafe, this idea that you were playing with your life. Um, so this is just some process shots from the, this is one of the walls. We did six walls in the area with the community. Um, this is one of the final ones. I, I particularly love this image because it's like this completely torn down um, building and the it, it, it feels a little bit like this where little groups of children are basically sitting on top of whatever there is and playing um, and so this this image is actually something that kind of st stuck with us so in terms of the impact itself we're talking about how sometimes the impact is immeasurable um, and we try but with the impact we, we look at it as almost a threefold impact um, they say in Hindu mythology that if something needs to be true it needs to ring th uh, true three times. The first is inside your atoms, the second is um, in the people around you, and the third is on a more universal level. And with us, we um, we try and kind of keep that threefold rule intact. So the first is personal healing. We have really therapeutic intimate workshops. Um, we also encourage sharing your truth and trauma without shame or guilt, and so that's the, the very personal level. I think personal um, change is definitely a medium of something much larger. The second is creating social dialogue by having these bystander conversations uh, through the act of people you know, reclaiming, taking back public space, and also in a universal visual language. Also, we're creating alternative social narratives from the ones that are dominant, and that becomes a really powerful way of creating social dialogue as well. <coughs> Sorry, my throat is awful. Um, and then the third is on a much larger level by mobilizing resources. Um, we're essentially working with emotional themes that resonate um, universally. Everybody can feel this idea of in inherited fears, or everyone has inherited some fear in their life. Um, um, so we work with much larger emotional themes that people across the world can understand. Uh, positive affirmation is a medium of social change, and finally, replacing fear or with peace and love. The Pakistan project in particular, though, was amazing because um, we formed a fearless collective that exists now as a, its own entity in Pakistan. It's an open source methodology, so everybody can download our workshop techniques, everybody can download um, our visuals and put them up in, in their own public uh, spaces. So on Christmas, I got this image of basically two girls in their you know, full salwar kameez putting up pictures of themselves being affectionate in public space, which is crazy. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Um, this was the image that they put up, and this was completely of their own volition. The second impact that we've seen of the Pakistan project, and this is, um, I'm talking about like kind of more large scale stuff, and not just the people within the communities that we were engaging with, um, is that the that we've been getting in a stream of different visuals from Pakistan, um, of women across Pakistan, sending in um, images about what it means for them to be fearless, um, and with their own personal stories as well. And then um, the third little piece of impact that we had was uh, when the blast happened in Lahore a couple of weeks ago, the reaction of some of the artists that we worked there uh, with was to go back actually to the park and paint this in the park. And this image has now gone viral on the internet, um, which is really incredible. And this is, again, completely off their own volition. Um, and with the, the way that we try and work with Fearless as an open source campaign, is this is exactly the thing that we encourage, that people should um, you know, react when something like what happened in Lahore um, happens, people should react also with art um, and take that kind of stance as an artist to be a peace builder. Um, this is a group that did the Lahore Wall. So yeah, that's that's it. And with Fearless now, we're really looking at going all over the, the world this year. We, we're going to be in Indonesia in May and following that uh, Lebanon and all over the place. 
<coughs> also doing a fearless yatra across India and Pakistan, which is something we're in the process of working out. So yes, that's fearless, and my throat is so bad. <laughs> Thank you, Thanks. <coughs> All yours. Screen one. Thank you, Moid, uh, for inviting me. Uh, to answer these questions and maybe to uh, share a different perspective, um, whether, you know, how arts and culture affects peace building and should artists be, should they consider themselves peace builders or is there a need for artists to be peace builders? I think the best way to, for me to share a light on this is just tell you a personal uh, journey, a, a story. So I was, how many people from South Asia here today? Okay, great. So you probably know that if you're born to a South Asian family, whether, it's, uh, whether you're Pakistani or Indian or Bangladeshi, your parents give you two choices for a career. <laughs> Mine gave me doctor and doctor. <laughs> and my earliest memory, um, six years old, was at a family wedding. This is when family weddings took place uh, you know, at home, not in five-star hotels. And there always used to be Sufi music at our family weddings. And I remember like, being you know, very young, <coughs> watching uh, these kawals singing the Muskalandar, you know, which is a very popular uh, folk tune. You know. And what, what was more amazing for me was, was, you know, my family was very conservative, but everybody was dancing. Uncles, aunts, grandmothers, grandfathers, uh, little kids, and whirling. And also what was very interesting was that some people from time to time would go up to the musicians and throw money on them. And so I thought that's not a bad job to have, actually. <laughs> and Though the, the poetry, uh, the Sufi poetry, you know, I didn't understand it, but it touched my heart in a way. The music, the rhythm, the groove, uh, it created a state of fana, mystical ecstasy. And I, it touched me very powerfully. The other, uh, and I was growing up in Lahore at my grandmother's house, so we used to catch uh, Amritsar television. And uh, at that time, Pakistan only had one state channel, and so getting Doordarshan, which is the Indian state channel, was like this sort of you know, amazing uh, opportunity. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, there used to be a program called Chitarhar, mm -hmm. you know, which was film songs from India. So again, six to 10 years old, I religiously watched <coughs> Chitarhar. And all of those great uh, 70s songs, you know, they, they found a place in my heart. And it was a window Obviously, you know the story between the two nuclear-armed neighbors. Uh, you know, there was, no, there was no Facebook, SMS, Twitter at that time. So all you knew about India was what you read in the Pakistan Times, which was a state-controlled newspaper. But through these songs uh, and the movies, it was a window into India. It really, it, it, it was a, uh, in, in a sense, we also saw this, like Walt Disney cartoons, and, and it, was, it was this humanizing impact. Um, and I always saw India as a, as a friendly place, just at that age, watching the, the, the films, listening to the music. Uh, fast forward to age 11, my, my father, who was in the airlines, moved to New York, and my family arrived in Rockland County. Now, this was a huge culture shock, because uh, coming from a, a conservative Pakistani Muslim family into a, a, a junior high school, uh, in which I was the only brown, overweight Muslim kid. No friends, um, uh, and just it, everything was upside down. I went to a school called Aitzen College in Lahore, where you had to wear uniforms. Each time the teacher comes in, you have to stand up. But this was, you know, like n no rules applied, it seemed like. So for two years, I was completely lost until one day at the bus stop, a friend of mine, uh, Danny Spitz, uh, who went on to play guitar in the um, heavy metal band Anthrax. He came up to me on, on my bus stop and he said, Sal, Sal, Sal. I said, dude, you gotta get cool. <laughs> so I was like, cool? What is cool? So he, he took this red ticket from his back pocket. And he said, if you buy this ticket from me, you shall become cool. And I said, what's the ticket? He said, it's for a rock concert at Madison Square Garden. 
So in my head, I'm thinking of my conservative mother, me going to a rock concert, this ain't happening. But, you know, uh, one of the uh, greatest poets of the East, Alama Iqbal, um, he, he said that whisper in your heart has strength. It may not have wings, but it has the power to fly. So the whisper in my heart said, buy the ticket. T bought the ticket, went home, and so this was one single ticket for a Monday night in Madison Square Garden. And I said to my mother that there's this school project. <laughs> Everybody's going, which wasn't completely a lie because most of the kids from school were going. And but you have to drive me there. So my mother was like, uh, okay, but we have to dress up, you know, because South Asian kids dress up when they go out. So, uh, you know, a red and white striped pants, <laughs> black shiny boots, and uh, sort of uh, a black belt. And I go to Madison Square Garden, and I ask my mother to drop me off three blocks away, <laughs> get on the sidewalk, and I see this mass of humanity, you know, uh, long hair. I'm dating myself. This is the 70s now. Um, uh, you know, peace signs, torn jeans, and expressions which said dazed and confused. I think you know where I'm going with this. So as we enter the garden, it says, live in concert, Led Zeppelin. And uh, so I didn't know what Led Zeppelin was. I went in, and first of all, an hour goes by, nothing happens, but everybody's really happy. <laughs> and there's this really ha big haze of smoke everywhere, which smells kind of funny as well. And, and then an hour later, people, uh, you know, the, uh, the announcer says, please welcome Led Zeppelin, and the almighty shriek goes up. And I, saw, I see the four guys come up on stage, but one of them, the guitar player, has a two-headed guitar, dragons painted on his pants, laser lights hitting him, and he starts playing this riff. And 26,000 people in the garden say, Kashmir! <laughs> now, you know, for me, that was a scary place. <laughs> so, anyway, Three and a half hours later, out of this first time, uh, and you know, how does arts and culture have an effect on somebody's heart? From that e Kavali evening in, in Lahore to Led Zeppelin in Madison Square Garden, it was as if every, every nerve, every neuron was buzzing in a state of fana. So I went back home and I said to my mother, I have to get a guitar. The one mother was like, no one in our family has ever played a musical instrument, you know? We are doctors. <laughs> and I said, no, but I, I need to get a guitar. So she said, well, everybody works, save up enough money. And if you do, you can buy a guitar. She thought this was like a, a, you know, a week long infatuation. So I did, I worked as a bus boy at Blauville, Blauville Coach Diner and I saved up in six months $235 to buy a guitar. Once I had the guitar, it was it was just uh, chemistry uh, because I wouldn't come out of my room. I kept playing. I, it was something like an old friend, meeting an old friend and spending all the time until my parents really started to f worry. You know, uh, because I was spending all my time in the room playing this tuntana. And uh, so one day my uh, professor uncle from Pakistan came. He was professor of surgery at King Edward Medical College. And, uh, and my parents said, why don't you please go and extract him out of his room? <laughs> and uh, so he knocked on the door, I didn't answer, he came in, and I had this crazy look on my face, and I'm learning some Hendrix licks. And, and uh, he said, beta, son, what are you gonna do with your life? So right behind him was this picture of, of Jimmy Page and, and George Harrison, I said, I wanna be like those guys. So he went back to my parents, he said, send him back to Pakistan right now. <laughs> and that's what happened. Uh, as soon as I graduated from high school, I was sent back to Pakistan. And when I landed in Pakistan, the country had transformed. When we had left, there was a democracy. Uh, Prime Minister Zulfikari Ali Bhutto was the elected popular leader. But when we went back, uh, there was a, it was a uh, military dictatorship under General Zia. It's like having the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in power. It forced Islamization. Like w when I was growing up, yes, you could have kawals and women and men dancing together and no one batted an eyelid. Now from the state controlled 
TV channel to radio, everything was strictly monitored. You know, in parks, like uh, couples couldn't walk together holding hands in parks. Some used to be flogged, you know, for uh, in the, so it was a really dark, dark time where I came. And I, you know, this was a reverse culture shock coming back from the States back to uh, Lahore. So my first year in medical college, I thought I was going to go insane if I, because th there were no clubs, there were no uh, concerts, there was nothing that the youth could do. So what I decided was that we have a secret talent show. We just get young people from our first year class. And do you remember, some of you might remember, there used to be this show called The Gong Show, yeah. right? Which was like amateurs getting together and they'd be gonged when they were get too uh, carried away. So I, I said to my uh, schoolmates, my, my, uh, my me medical colleagues that, Anybody who can sing, anybody who can dance, anybody who can recite a poem or tell a joke, juggle, you're in, you're performing. And for myself, I decided I'm gonna f blow away these kids with Eddie Van Halen's eruption, which is really this fast-paced, finger-tapping guitar solo. This was the one, one chance where I could be, you know, uh, on stage and play something. So, Anyway, the, so it was a mixed gathering of 60, around 60, and my turn came after the juggler, and I went up on stage, and I closed my eyes, and I started wailing. And I had my amp on very loud, and obviously, you know, I thought that everybody's gonna be loving this, but th the screams that started coming got louder and louder, and I had my eyes closed, and I'm like, wow, I'm really a rock star. And until I realized that these screams are not of adulation, uh, they're of fear and apprehension. What had happened was that uh, on campus, there was this uh, student organization, jamaat e islami uh, religious organization. They had found out that off campus, there was this den of sin where boys and girls were uh, getting together for vulgarity, uh, uriani. Uh, that's the word that they would use, uh, like fashi and uriani, uh, which means like, you know, the most lewdest things are happening here. Anyway, they came over, I had my eyes open now. Some of them threw burqas and chadras on the girls, and one of them, this, this 20 something bearded guy, comes up, and before I could think what he was doing, he took my guitar, which I had bought, and he smashed it on the, on the marble floor. And that moment was, you know, a moment of reckoning for me because on the one hand, I was so uh, overpowered by fear because he said that if next time you play this, I'll shoot you. And the other thing was, this is the thing I had the most powerful connection to. And uh, uh, it was a turning point in my life. I went home and I thought that if these guys are gonna break my guitar and stop us from doing this, well, we're gonna do more of it. And so I started seven to eight underground rock bands in Lahore, in colleges. And we would just play in dorms. We would secret uh, uh, basements. Uh, cool aunts and uncles would allow us into homes. And, 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 and we would just do cover songs, you know? We were Bon Jovi, Bruce Springsteen, U2, uh, basically cover songs. <laughs> Until one day, one of, one of the bands that I was in was called Vital Signs. And um, the lead singer of that band is a very good friend of mine, Junaid. You know, we were thinking, well, we, we play cover songs to a few dozen people. Why don't we actually express what's in our hearts about Pakistan under Ziaul Haq? You know, because it's a kingdom of darkness. So that song uh, was called Dil Dil Pakistan. Now, we had just recorded that on a home four-track recorder. Uh, we didn't have echo or reverb, so we used the bathroom tiles for the reverb. <laughs> and lo and behold, that song, uh, a TV producer, uh, Shweb Mansoor, who actually did the film Bol that you were talking about, you know, on women's empowerment, he, he said, listen, this song is great. And I have a feeling that because this is a patriotic song, I'll be able to get it on television, right? So one state channel, and this song goes on air to millions and millions of young people in Pakistan who were sick and just like us, frustrated that there was no way to vent your feelings. And the song basically said, look, we want to be modern, yet we're Pakistani. Dil Dil Pakistan, Jaan Jaan Pakistan. And overnight, we became pop stars. 
And what amazing thing that happened, I don't know if, if, if I mean, none of this is planned, but the, the year that this song went, uh, you know, hit the sort of everybody's hearts, General Zia's plane crashed. <laughs> and that was the end of military dictatorship. So from being pariahs of Pakistani culture, I'm not saying that we want your engineer. But that's what happened. Of peace, <laughs> yes. So, so, so what happened was from being pariahs of Pakistani culture, uh, we had elections and a democratic, democratically elected prime minister, youngest woman, Benazir Bhutto, came into power. And she loved the song, Dil Dil Pakistan. She said, you have to do this at my house, at the prime minister's house, and on television. So society changed. Now, I'm not saying the vital signs changed society, but we were a part of it. Um, the other story I want to, um, do, do I have time? Five, five minutes. Five. So the, the, the other thing that happened was that um, I did graduate from medical school, but I thought that, you know, pursuing a career in the arts, uh, you know, it's connected to your heart. And, and so I said, I can, I said to my parents, I can always come back to medicine. Just let me see how far this band thing goes. So I ended up being part of two of Pakistan's uh, biggest bands, Vital Signs and, uh, and Junoon, the one that I founded. And when Junoon had a hit single in India, we toured all across India. Now, this is supposedly the enemy country. Yet, you know, whether it was politicians, film stars, and who else did you say? Um, gods and goddesses? God, well, I don't know about the gods and goddesses, but definitely <laughs> politicians, film stars, and youth came to our concerts in droves. It, it humanized the face of Pakistan to India in a way, you know, in the first, our first tour of India. And, and I found the music would open a door and then deeper uh, conversations would take place on all sort of political issues, religious issues, everyday teenage issues. Um, and that hasn't changed. I was just, I performed in Delhi in February uh, for UNESCO. And you know, it's, it's incredible, you, you have one song uh, or, or one album and the entire country knows you and you, you, you're friends with them and they're friends with you. Uh, that's the first step of humanizing, you know, uh, what uh, culture humanizes, what politics demonizes. Um, so I can't stress enough how po powerful uh, music, films, uh, cricket, sports uh, is in, in humanizing uh, society. And, and the, the other thing I want to say is that, um, you know, uh, in 2008, um, there had never been a rock concert in Sirinagar, in Kashmir. And there was a gentleman, uh, Madanjeet Singh, uh, who headed the South Asian Foundation, and he said, you know, th those uh, college kids really, you know, would love a rock concert. Nobody wants to go there. Would you, you know, would you agree? And I said, hell yes, you know. So while we were flying from New York to Dubai on t uh, to Delhi, uh, I got a message from the militants uh, who said, there's no way we're gonna allow a rock concert. If you land here, we'll shoot you on sight. And uh, anyway, I, I realized that this was too big an opportunity, so we did go there. And because there was a huge security uh, um, cordon, cordon there, there were these barbed wires, but instead of, uh, uh, in spite of them, 10,000 college kids jumped over barbed wire to come to see our show at the edge of the Dal Lake with the Himalayas in the back. Uh, this is the same place where Ravi Shankar gave George Harrison his first sitar lesson. And I have to tell you that, you know, with all the security that's there, the military uh, people, guns, that one concert that day in May, it just seemed that it just, I'm not saying one concert, you know, will, uh, uh, you know, r resolve the Kashmir uh, conflict. But what it did do was it was humanize people, you know? Uh, everybody was singing, girls were singing, guys were singing. Um, and I think India's pri president, Partiba Patel, mm -hmm. she, she was singing on to Sayuni as well. So it's important that we continue this people-to-people -people contact through arts and culture. Um, I think I'll stop right there. Good. Yeah. Wow, thanks. Um,
I'm very glad we did this because I don't think I've heard the word humanize for a while when it comes to security conversation. So uh, thanks. Uh, we'll open it up for questions, comments. Um, I want to start with one myself to all three panelists, if, if I could. Um, our sort of moniker to work in Pakistan slash South Asia um, is what we call trying to promote the tolerance of diversity of opinion. So essentially, the moniker is diversity. Uh, and what I find incredible about this space is that unlike some of the uh, opposition, where really the moniker is dogma, whether you agree with it or not is, is, a, is a different story. And a lot of the mainstream thinking is also dogma, quite frankly. When we try and counter some of the narratives coming from the other side, we also tend to become very dogmatic about it and say, this is right and that is wrong. What I find incredible about this space, if I, if I may, is that I don't think you're telling people what is right. Mm -hmm. All you're telling people is think and do what you think is right. Um, have I got this right? And if so, then could one common thread um, across this space of arts and culture, whether it's music, film, you know, your work, Shiloh, uh, is it diversity? Is that what it is? Because one of the things that I've, I've and I, I don't claim to be an expert at all in this field, but one of the things I've seen missing is I haven't seen people like yourselves talk about this, this issue of diversity as openly, clearly, and, and bluntly as I think ultimately this all adds up to. And the reason I bring this up is that you can go to cultures and say, um, we are going to challenge and counter extremism, and you'll get a very negative reaction. Even from people like me or Salman saying, ah, this is not, you know, people start getting stigmatized, communities think you're targeting them. You can go and talk about terrorism, and people will very quickly react and say, you think all of us are terrorists. You know, but when you talk about tolerance of diversity, even cultures and societies that are uh, confronting terrorism, extremism, violence, uh, do not react negatively, at least in my experience. They do agree that, yes, we need diversity. How to get there is another question. So I wanted to throw this open and see whether, whether there are any reactions. <laughs> I, I, think, <clears throat> I think you have to allow people naturally to gravitate towards what they think is authentic, number one, right? Uh, and I think that's why authentic uh, storytellers, filmmakers, uh, musicians, artists, uh, it's crucial that they need to be supported. I mean, I, so for the last two years, I've been working on polio eradication in Pakistan. And as you know, many, many uh, health workers, mostly women, have been shot by the Taliban because they were trying to just give a, a drug. And, and so there was such a fear about talking about polio. So what I did was I did, uh, I, made a music video focused on the work that the health workers are doing and the good that that happens when you you know are vaccinated and and I got you know uh, uh, Pakistani celebrities and icons to be in that video as well so what it does is and uh, women men so diversity is, is and, and religious leaders as well so what it tells a society is that the whole community is behind this effort as opposed to it being pushed by outside, right? And so there's ownership in it. And, and I'm, uh, 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 I think any, if you want to achieve any sort of behavioral change, societal positive, societal change, peace, you need to get the entire community, socioeconomic groups together behind uh, a, a movement. Uh, I saw that, like, so this is one example, polio. The other thing I saw was there was a reform movement uh, uh, for election reform, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was invited to that, and you know, like a million people, young people, women, uh, uh, coming out, and you know, it's dangerous to be, to have large congregations in Pakistan, as you know. But singing songs, it brings communities together. You know, uh, yes, there are politically charged speeches, but I think it was the music which kept people there for hours and hours and hours and hours. Uh, and many artists w were a part of that. So anything which helps bringing a community together, look, the, uh, movies, as you mentioned, Nosheen, in Pakistan are huge in pa the, the, these days. Indigenous, indigenous, not only Indian movies, but also indigenous movies uh, are packed, sold out, because people want to have a collective experience. Uh, and, and the more issues that we take in our storytelling, our movies, our television, uh, which impact people authentically, I think that, that will be powerful. Mm -hmm. okay. I, 
agree. I think also for us, like, we look at a lot of um, representation in public space is a way of uh, accepting diversity and allowing for that kind of diversity. So if you do see, for example, more transgender um, people in ads or in public space as big murals or in music videos, then perhaps there's going to be a little bit of um, an opening for acceptance. Yeah. Um, as Salman mentioned, um, you know, films um, are addressing the same issue also. Um, the more space and the more alternative uh, discourse you make, uh, the more diversity you're going to have. So there are going to be different mediums. And I think they should all be involved. Mm -hmm. And hence, uh, we try and focus on all kinds of stuff here, especially in the US. Um, one way, we uh, there was something interesting we did recently, how we got together with uh, Shakespeare Theater that was playing Othello. Um, and Othello itself was um, a Muslim general portrayed in a stereotypical way. So we thought it was a great way to bring the community together and have discuss how Muslims or marginalized um, communities are portrayed in certain ways in traditional theater here. So it provided a nice form of uh, platform for them to speak and to engage with the mainstream. Um, and it was nice to get an alternative view on things. So let me, let me open it up, and I'll go in the order that I see the hands, um, and then we'll leave time to Salman to mesmerize us. I will start there, and then move this way. Um, I can also speak with that in my Well, I, I think we're recording, so. Oh, okay. um, I was just wondering if you, anybody could speak to um, how institutions like the National College of Art in Lahore um, sort of interact with these uh, programs that are kind of external from government um, kind of coming in um, and what role specifically um, that particular college has. Um, okay, so NCA actually was a big partner for us on the Fearless Collective tour, at least, um, both in Lahore as well as in Rawalpindi. And uh, it's actually NCA, NCA students that have now stayed back as part of the Fearless Collective in Pakistan. Um, so the way that, that we engaged them, at least, was training them in our methodology. Um, and so now, you know, at the, the park uh, following the explosion, when it was NCA students that went and painted that as well. Mm -hmm. um, also, NCA was a very significant partner for us in Rawalpindi because... Um, um, they they have really opened up their doors to the transgender community. They have lots of transgender employees that work within the campus uh, in Pindi, which is a really big deal for a campus to do as well. Um, but <clears throat> I feel like, at least from my experience there, it, uh, a lot of the training is on uh, classical and fine arts. And so this was a very rare anomaly for everyone to sort of have is like going out in, in, in public space and talking about one's own issues, working with a different community, realizing that the tool um, that was being taught to them so well um, could also be a tool for a much larger engagement. Just that colleges in general are crucial. Um, in terms of um, you know young people, they're unsure about the future, and one way they are able to um, express themselves is through you know art, as uh, Sheila said. If if one way uh, you know if seventy percent of Pakistan, I think also India is under the age of twenty five, mm -hmm. and and so college kids, schools, uh, and in schools, if there were funding grants for musicians artists to be able to express themselves. You know, the biggest, uh, like, yes, you mentioned uh, Coke Studio, uh, and there's another program, Nescafe Basement, which allows young people to come on television and, and play music. But I think beyond just the, these glitzy TV shows, if, if there were some grants for colleges, schools, specifically for arts and culture, I think uh, uh, Pakistan, for, um, if we're speaking about Pakistan, it's an immensely talented country. People would, uh, but pe people would create. So, funding grants at the college level is, uh, I think, near the hour. Yes. Hi. Uh, my question is actually a continuation of your question, the, the diversity question, and I think this is really important for Pakistan because you know whenever we have, uh, you mentioned films, uh, Nausheen, but if you look at all the creators of these films, they usually come from a certain class. Um, as well, that, that's the same thing with music. Um, you know, it's easier to be a rebel when you actually have 
uh, um, you know, money behind you. But you know, when you go to a lot of these areas, for example, we, we did a project in, southern, uh, uh, in Bhutan, in southern Punjab, and we engaged with a lot of students. You know, even uh, for them, uh, you know, to, to even come and, and actually become, uh, there are actually no avenues for them to become musicians, for even for them to be able to conceive that becoming a musician or becoming a, becoming a filmmaker is something that can, you know, is, is, is something that could be a potential career. Um, you know what? What do you think is the way forward for that? How do we sort of engage these people who are di who are disenfranchised, okay. and how do we tell their stories and actually get them to understand that this this could be a potential career for them, that this could take them where, where you know where, where they can go? Thank you so much. Should I have a response to Please. that? Please. Um, so I think it's definitely like a kind of misconception of the urban world to think that art is some sort of luxury. Um, if you look at, uh, I can only speak about India, but if you look at, um, say you know, traditional um, homes across India, uh, all across Gujarat and Rajasthan, all of those homes are painted. Uh, in the south of India, we have kolam outside every single uh, doorway. Um, I also lived in and studied with Sufis with this group called the Kabir Project. And Sufi music is not, um, you know, a luxury in any way. It's very much a part of, like, rural culture, uh, both in India and Pakistan. And I believe that Sufi music is protest music because it's, you know, anti-establishment. Sure. Um, so. I think this is a big misconception, that, and I think it is because of the way that the education system is currently trained towards creating doctors and engineers, that you feel like you don't have access to beauty, you don't have access to telling a story. But I think, and also I think there's a big problem with thinking that like, it's only the university students and kids who should be engaged with art. You know, it's like, hey, you're in university, take a paintbrush, paint a wall, and then graduate and become a serious human being. Um, but I think that's a, that's a huge issue. I think we, we as adults, um, we also need to be engaging with different art practices. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to add to that, I do totally agree that it is not mainstream as yet in Pakistan. I think um, it's underutilized and it basically focuses on a certain segment of the society and they participate much more than the rest. Um, Lahore Literary Festival, I personally do um, feel it could do much more uh, in terms of its target audience. Um, it's not mainstream as yet. Um, films, you're right, the directors and producers need huge resources to be able to do that. But cinema is a very young field right now in Pakistan. So given any support, I'm sure it'll do well. Um, you do have, uh, you know, these are very low budget movies. To, so to say it's um, keeping off uh, other people from participating, it's true. But it is still open to many um, to come up with films with uh, small budgets and all. Um, but that's true of basic education too. I mean, it's only available to a certain segment in society, sadly. So the more you expand that, the more um, arts and culture programs you expand, the more you'll reach out to mainstream. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I just want to um, ask you about uh, the, the period in which uh, artists such as yourselves flourished. It seems that there's been a pattern throughout South, <coughs> South Asian history, like before partition, 1940s, uh, Bombay gave birth to uh, prolific artists like Sadat Hasan Manto, Ismat Chukhtai, 70s, uh, uh, people like yourself in the 70s, Vital Signs, Strings and everything later. So uh, would you say that India and Pakistan, considering the, the amount of stray incidents uh, that have uh, been very prevalent in both countries, that we're on the cusp of like another progressive writers or progressive artists movements of sorts that can really usher some sort of change through literature, arts, and eventually policy. So uh, yeah, uh, in February, um, I was in India for a month uh, supporting this indie f film that I did, Rhythm. And what I did uh, uh, in, on the days that I was off was I went into colleges in many uh, seven to eight different cities to speak with students. I took my 12 string and just tell stories and have a conversation with students. Uh, uh, and, you know, what I gain from that and from talking to friends in the film industry and outside, if, if, if the governments just allowed Indians and Pakistanis to meet with each other, people to people contact, you know, so much, uh, so many conflicts would be resolved. I'm not saying that, you know, the, the those, uh, Sort of political conflicts, but but in terms of just humanizing the other, when you uh, when you went to Pakistan, you must have, you know, come with a completely different perspective, mm -hmm. and just like me, when I went to India, m m you know, I don't go there as a you know Pakistani going into this country where, you know, 
there's a Kashmir conflict that goes in artist. I think if you allowed Indian uh, uh, artists, uh, uh, storytellers to come to Pakistani educational institutions, just speak and vice versa, that would be a huge uh, um, starting point. Uh, the, the other thing is that um, I think the movies that they are playing now, I think General Musharraf uh, needs to be uh, given the credit that he allowed Indian movies to be played in Pakistani cinemas. Not that they weren't being viewed before, uh, but, but now people can go to a theater and you know, Indian film stars are huge in Pakistan. And Pakistani artists are getting a chance to work uh, in Bollywood, many of them. So uh, th that needs to be accelerated and, and fortified. Uh, and I do agree with the, the gentleman there also. That, uh, that, you know, young people, there's so many people who write to me, they look, I can be a singer, I can. So my organization, SSG, Samina, my wife, and I started uh, SSGWI, which funds uh, music education, uh, which funds um, cross-cultural dialogue. Um, and if we could give opportunity, and then these are big numbers, if you just allow people to follow their passion, whether it's painting, uh, uh, acting, music, uh, you'll see in a decade, if you plant these seeds now, all these kids who are going to madrasas and uh, even they listen to all the, movie, uh, the, the, the songs and they watch all the movies, but they have no outlet. So if you pro provided an outlet for them, in 10 years time, you'll see positive results. In terms of also what you were saying about whether there's almost a new wave of artists who are using their tools to create change um, rising, at least in India, I feel like there isn't. As I feel like right now, a lot of media is focused on um, being kind of young and cool and urban. And so a lot of the, the um, you know, alternative music and art scene in India is is completely obsessed with that. Um, I think part of that also comes from our general lack of political consciousness in India, like a little bit of apathy. Um, so, yeah. And I'm not sure about Pakistan, though. I know that um, you know, the, there was Sabine Mahmood, whose work was really incredible. She was one of, uh, going to be one of the collaborators on the Fearless Project in Pakistan as well. Um, and when we went there, the rest of the T2F team did come out and, and paint with us in Liari. And for them, that was a really big deal as well, because having lost Sabine, um, this was the first time that they were taking a step to get involved in something, go out to Liari. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, I was once told that the single biggest tool um, countries like India and Pakistan have to keep the status quo going is the visa regime. Yeah. So yeah. it's not going to change anytime soon. <laughs> Kiran. Thanks. So um, I want to ask you a question more specifically about um, big believer in people to people contact, etc. Right. And but when we sort of get into that mode, we're looking at two sets of conversations. One is either on the side of hatred or one is sort of on the other extreme side when we think people to people contact we think oh if people could just learn to see how alike they are then they'll just get along but there's something more that happens in the middle of that right so I guess I just want to hear from your personal experiences what that in between space of you want to call it counter narrative you want to call it messy narrative etc so well you know, I think, I think it was Gandhi who said, uh, honest disagreement is a sign of progress. Um, and I've had very difficult uh, conversations. Uh, and I've seen groups have very difficult uh, conversations between India and Pakistan. But when you allow, when somebody is face to face and they're there authentically, people have a way of working things out. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, views will be changed overnight. But a conversation begins. And, and, and a conversation uh, uh, builder, I mean, arts and culture is a huge conversation uh, builder. Uh, you, you know, there was a movie called uh, by Salman Khan, Bajrangi Bhaijan, uh, which, which, which had a, the plot was that an Indian, um, a, a Hindu sadhu, I think it was, uh, right, returns this Muslim girl. Uh, to, you know, takes this great risk to go over the border to return this girl to her mother in Pakistan. And that resonated so deeply. You see, the emotional space is such that this is where everything starts to crumble. <laughs> and, 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 and something opens up where there is, there is a desire to understand, you know? I think that's where arts and culture is so crucial. We can have academic uh, conversations which are necessary, 
we can see all the data and the foreign ministries talking to each other, but that's a, that's a very uh, rigid format. You need people to have that conversation. I think what you, you keep kind of going back to about humanizing is really crucial. And um, of course, when we're painting, for example, painting a Khwaja Sarah in public space, you know, of course, there are people who are going to come and yell and fight and th there's dialogue. And that's also the kind of dialogue that we encourage completely because I think even in those small conversations, there's a room for something turning, something changing. We totally want it to happen, yeah. yeah. And we've had a range of things, right, from fights to everything, yeah. Yeah, um, so this is a question for Salman also. Uh, Moid mentioned that um, there needs to be diversity. And I think one area where um, we have a very diverse country in Pakistan is the number of cultures and languages that we have. And that, that Sufi music that you heard as a kid was probably in Punjabi, my guess. Some of languages. it. Yeah. And, and the point is that there is a lot of um, in, within the Sufi mu tradition in Pakistan, in, 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 in Punjab, there is 800 years of built-in mechanism to fight intolerance, to fight militancy. Why is the language of Punjabi not taught in schools and why is this poetry not taught in schools in the Punjab in Pakistan today? Why have we cut that off and, and basically self-destructed as a result? Because if those kids had, had learned that, that, that kind of poetry growing up, they would, that would always be in their minds, right? So just, just a thought out there. Well, the, the, two points in that question. One, that th this music, Sufi music, is an 800-year-old tradition. And, and the father of uh, Qawwali was a man called Hazrat Amir Khusro, who uh, came from diversity himself. Uh, he had a, um, a Persian father and an Indian mother. And he was a uh, philosopher, musician, uh, um, great uh, sort of Renaissance man. And he, his whole interest in coming up with uh, a different genre of music, which became Qawwali, right, uh, was because India was this polyglot population of Hindus uh, uh, and Jains and Muslims and who spoke different languages. So he wanted to create one kind of a style of singing. Uh, he was heavily influenced by the uh, bhajan, uh, the Hindu uh, bhajan style of singing, and also Persian poetry, Arabic folk tunes. So Tarana, uh, which I'll, I, I think I can, I'll play that for you as well, <laughs> brought people together. You know, that style of singing was it was like mainstream, uh, easy to sing tunes, uh, and it brought people together or from diverse backgrounds. Um, that's one aspect of the Sufi. Uh, and then why just sing in Punjabi? Because, well, one of the things is because Punjab is the biggest province in Pakistan, and there's already uh, um, great conflict created by the fact that, that it's not Punjabistan, it's Pakistan. You know, to, to recognize Sindhi, to recognize uh, uh, the, the Baloch, uh, the, the Pakhtun. So, so if you were just singing in Punjabi, which, yes, uh, uh, a lot of Qawwali is in Punjabi, but it's also in Saraiki, it's also in Sindhi, it's also in Urdu, you know, in Persian. Um, I, I, I don't think that one kind of language um, is enough for Sufi music, you know? <coughs> Let me, if I may, um, end this here because we want to give Salman a little bit of time, uh, as I said, to mesmerize us. Um, uh, I was only relegated to watching you on TV since you never allowed me in, so I have a chance now. Uh, but please join me in thanking the panel. I am very glad that we've done this. Um, and uh, some of you who come to our events um, often know that this is a very different um, sort of genre, if I will, uh, in terms of the events that we, we do. But I think we should definitely do more of this because this conversation, if our security side does not hear, uh, I'm afraid we'll keep measuring uh, that we are failing over and over again. Thank you very much. Can I get a glass of water? Sure. Mashin, can, I, can yeah. I share yours? Thanks. Yes. <laughs> um, can we pull these up? And then I can. I can just
put this one. Uh, on this. Over here? Here, all the, I think we could uh, put these up. section of it, he uses the words, syllables, om tum tanana, om tum tanana, om tum tanana, which in themselves don't have any meaning, but when a mess of people sing it together, it creates a sense of musical unity, uh, or mystical uh, ecstasy, fana. So let's try and see if we can do that. No hell 
above us only sky Imagine all the people living like me Imagine this Nothing to kill or die for And no divisions to Imagine all the people Living for today Ooh, You may say I'm a dreamer but I'm not the only one I hope someday you'll join us And the world will live as one Now we all possess I wonder if you can <coughs> The need for greed or hunger A brother who will all Sing with me Imagine all the people Sharing all the world You fool You may say Without doing one Junoon song. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot. You have you to do it once. We have. <laughs> okay, See, I'll do a little medley. I'll it's do little... all about listening to you live for me, so <laughs> I have to get it. I have to get it. Well, then you are uh, you know, the answer to those three questions. <laughs> <laughs> you still didn't let me in your concert. So <laughs> Wait, you should sing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the boss speaks. So, um, so I, I'm just gonna do a little medley of stuff that Great. if you came from Pakistan, you'd know this. Um, so this is the song that uh, we were in college and we recorded a home four track.
say your name. Say your name. Wasted hours, I think it's all come together. <laughs> <laughs> it all makes sense in the end. <laughs> Thank you very much, all, for joining us.